Okay, so we are here with um, three amazing guests for our very first episode of Just Birth, um, our new uh, series uh, with uh, roundtables on birth equity. Um, so we are planning to host these once a month, uh, featuring uh, staff, students, instructors, alumni from Doula Canada, uh, sometimes guests to speak on a topic. Uh, my name is Kira. I am a staff member at Doula Canada, and I am also um, in the Triple Stream program, um, certifying as a doula through Doula Canada. Um, and I'm here with three amazing guests today. Uh, I'm here with Helene, uh, who is in the 14 week holistic certification program. Uh, I'm also here with, uh, so Helene is also uh, a parent herself. Uh, she uh, practices Islam and also practices veiling. Uh, I'm also here with Humera, um, who is a student in our triple stream program. Um, studying to be a doula. Uh, she is also Muslim and uh, wears a uh, veil and a niqab. She wears a hijab and a niqab, so she'll be talking uh, a bit about the, the distinction between those two things later on. Um, and I'm also here with Sakira, who is a student in our fertility program, certifying. Um, and all three of our guests are also parents themselves, so have lived experience with raising a family um, and juggling the pressures of work and school and parenthood. So we'll be talking about all of that today, as well as their experiences um, within the healthcare system, both seeking healthcare and supporting clients in their community while practicing veiling. Okay, so um, I was hoping that you guys could uh, each begin by telling us a bit um, about your choice to veil. Um, I'm aware that not all women, Muslim women, practice veiling. Um, so I was hoping that you could uh, each tell us a bit about uh, why it's a practice that you've chosen to do. Okay, so I grew up seeing my mom and my aunts all wearing a hijab. I tried wearing it on and off from when I was about 12 till when I turned 16. Um, my family's quite liberal, so I would only wear it when I would go to school or when I went to work, but I would take it off on the weekends. And then maybe when I turned 22, I realized the importance of wearing a hijab. I always knew that it was an obligation, but I started doing my own research and I checked online for you know, different resources. And all of a sudden there was all these influencers on YouTube who started sharing their journeys and their stories and they made it seem so effortless and normal. And another thing that they were doing where they were showing us different materials and different ways to style our hijab, different colors and patterns, and they raised so much awareness. And um, I think that's what really helped me because I always knew that I was eventually going to wear one, but mainly um, just seeing that it's so normal and people all over the world are doing daily things and they can make it look nice as well. Um, I think that really gave me the confidence to keep it on. Thank you. Um, so I'll go next. Um, mm -hmm. I actually grew up in an opposite environment uh, than Zakira. My immediate family, more like my mom, my aunts, my cousins, weren't really wearing hijab during my childhood days. So I think for me, the hijab um, or the veil and the niqab actually come from a much deeper place. Um, I just feel like I had a natural zeal or like an inkling to wear one. Um, it, I just felt it was more a part of me, my faith and my religion. Um, you would think that I'm Muslim and I put it on and it was easy, but actually I struggled quite a lot in the beginning in a sense where it wasn't really accepted by my parents they weren't very keen on it, but they came around over time. And as well as I struggled because when I put it on, I was actually in middle school. So it wasn't very accepted by the principal and I kind of had a negative uh, start off to it, but it ended up being a good outcome. And I feel like my experience with this has really um, put a deeper meaning to why I cover my face or wear the hijab. Um, so mm -hmm. I've been wearing the hijab since I was like, six or seven like on and off and then I decided when I was 12 years old suddenly um, from influence of a really good friend that I would just put it on and it's been almost 21 years and I have never taken it back off so that's my story and I feel like it just comes naturally for me cool thank you 
It's nice to hear from both of you, and I'll share my bit. Um, well, the reason why I started wearing the hijab was it was first year university, and I was not wearing one. I lived normally like everybody else, and I thought, you know, I'll get there one day. Although a year prior to that, I had promised myself and my parents that I would, but something happened, and there was a change of heart. And so when it came the first year of university, I met a few international students, one's from Tanzania, the other one from Senegal. And uh, my friend from Senegal actually came to, I went to Ottawa U, so she came to Ottawa U with the intention of wearing the, the veil, like the, the headscarf, uh, because where she was, she couldn't practice. Her family didn't encourage it. People around her didn't encourage it. The uh, other individual, the one from Tanzania, was actually searching for for a greater purpose. Like she wanted to find her purpose in life and like where, who and what do I follow? So she explored everything in Christianity, everything in Hinduism. She explored everything, everything possible. And then she fell into Islam and she started having conversations with us, us both saying why, like to myself. And there was another sister, actually another friend of mine that came from Saudi. And so she was asking us, you both came here you are practicing Muslims, quote unquote, but you do not veil. Why is that? So when she started questioning, questioning us this way, I was like, what, what's my reason? I, I didn't really have one. And here she is yearning for something more. And I had the quote unquote more, but wasn't quite fully practicing. Um, and that kind of made me think twice. Um, the friend that came from Senegal started wear, doing what Homer is doing. She was fully veiling face everything, everything. And, and it, that really surprised me. And I was like, I have it. I have Islam. I know, I know what it is, but I wasn't practicing. That made me get closer to my faith and um, understand it on a different level. Uh, and then one day I decided I'm going to do it alongside with those friends of mine. And the night I decided to do it, I was going to visit my parents the next morning. And I was saying to myself, what if you don't wake up in the morning? What if you pass away right now and you wouldn't have had completed your obligation as a Muslim woman? And that really scared me to the core. And I started saying to myself, there's a bigger purpose. There's a, there's a reason why we are ordained to do these things. And everybody can take their time to do it and you'll come to it when you're ready for it. Um, but that was my time. And that's when I started railing and I haven't taken it off ever since. And I do get comments. I remember my first year wearing the, the veil and um, it was a hot summer day in Ottawa and this um, boy, let's call him, and he was like, don't you get hot under there? And I just kind of looked at him like, you should try it. It's pretty cool. And I just left him. <laughs> there are always going to be comments and not necessarily even about your veil. It's going to be about something else. Um, and when you do it out of, out of willingness, it's really easy. So mm. Uh, mm. And I hope that my daughters will follow one day. Yeah. So I'm hearing a theme in what you've all said that as much as there is a view in Islam that it's part of the obligation of your faith, you all very much came to this by choice. It's not something that you feel was forced upon you. Um, and I think that that maybe would challenge a lot of the assumptions that people make. I think that we uh, have a tendency when we see women who um, veil either by covering their hair or covering their whole face, where there's an assumption that like their culture requires them to do it or their religion or their family requires them to do it. And you've all talked about finding a real, really deep connection to your faith in your own time and in your own way. Um, I'm curious about um, how you've seen some of those assumptions about women who veil play out in your healthcare interactions or in the interactions that you've seen um, from people in your community, um, clients that you've supported. So for me, I live in a very multicultural area in Toronto, and there are a lot of Muslim immigrant families that live here. Um, and it is true, like for a lot of these families, English is their second language. 
Um, I personally haven't experienced racism in a healthcare setting in this area, but I'm going to share something that one of my cousins had gone through. Um, so she was about nine weeks pregnant and she was no longer feeling any of her pregnancy symptoms. So she ended up going to her doctor wanting a requisition to have an ultrasound done just to make sure that everything was okay. Um, the first thing that she had faced was a secretary started speaking to her in a very degrading manner and didn't really want to engage with her in any conversation. And she just kind of tried to brush her off by saying um, that she's fine, like, you know, you're fine, nothing's wrong with the baby, um, but didn't really speak to her. Um, and then my cousin was persistent saying like, no, like I can, you know, kind of like a mom's intuition, something's wrong. So she finally gave in and gave her that requisition to have the ultrasound done. Um, unfortunately, the ultrasound showed no fetal heartbeat. So my cousin went back to the doctor's office for a follow-up from that ultrasound, and they first made her wait almost two and a half hours before she was being seen by the doctor. And then when the uh, doctor finally entered the room, my cousin was crying in tears, and the doctor's first words to her were, don't women in your culture have multiple babies? This is just your first miscarriage, so you're crying. Wait until it's your fourth or fifth one, then you'll be laughing. And I don't know if the doctor tried to come across as like making a joke. I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know why somebody would even say something like that. Um, but I think firstly that the secretary was dismissive of the whole situation, maybe because she probably assumed that the patient is not going to fight for her rights, you know, because mm -hmm. like I wonder if this was someone who wasn't while speaking in English, they would just listen and say, OK, like, I guess you were telling me nothing's wrong and then they would just leave it. So I think mm -hmm. that's, that was one of the points. And then secondly, when the doctor was assuming that all uh, like women who wear a hijab come, um, have multiple babies, it comes across a very insensitive because it's really, oh a, gosh, personal, yeah. <laughs> it's really a personal preference, you know? So it has nothing to do mm -hmm. with the culture or religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's just so loaded with horrible assumptions, right? Like assumptions about family size and family planning assumption that because you have a lot of babies that a loss isn't still impactful that's horrible oh um yeah uh, mara Helene, do you have any thoughts on that yeah I mean, me, honestly it's, it's, it's um i remember for my own miscarriage i wasn't here i was in the middle east during the time uh, but I was basically told to suck it up and this is your first and so what? And this is, mind you, I, I was in the Muslim country where you would think they would have a little bit more sensitivity towards the subject, but it's besides the point. I, I think medical care everywhere, it's interesting like that. They become mm -hmm. sort of desensitized to, to, to what really matters. A loss is a loss, mm -hmm. like you said regardless yeah. of if you have five children prior to it or if you had no nothing like it, it's still a loss it's a huge disadvantage and it's a moment to grieve uh, so mm. I feel like this is where um uh, systematic racism kind of stems from um personally I have a a similar story. Um I had a bit of infertility before I actually had my firstborn and um you know, that was fine. Then when I actually was expecting my firstborn, I went to the ER, really scared, really nervous, what's going on. My husband was actually away for the month of Ramadan. And I went by myself, a friend dropped me off. And when I showed up at the ER, I told him, I told the ER doctor, you know, I've seems like I have a progesterone issue. Like, you know, is there anything you could do? You can help me. And, you know, he said, okay, you know, what? let's do some, um, blood work or an ultrasound so I had everything done and when I had the ultrasound done there was actually nothing um, viable that seemed on the ultrasound so you know I was like okay you know I, I'll just go home and I'll wait it out since I've already had this experience before I'd rather not do anything or intervene um, he literally literally looked me in the eye and he said um, you know are you surprised that you're miscarrying I'm pretty sure you're married to your cousin and then he literally looked at me and he said, um, and I'd also really be interested to check your vitamin D levels because you're fully covered. Um, you know, I was livid. I was really upset. And I said to him, you know, I didn't say much. I was just, first, I was just so upset the fact that maybe I'm going to lose another pregnancy. 
And I had come so far from losing the other two pregnancies prior the year before. And then he said to me, you know, I think you should have a DNC done tonight. And I really looked at him and I said, no, I'm really sorry. I'm, I think I'm going to go home and I need to consult with my husband. And then I will, you know, call back. And if I obviously see signs of infection or there's an, an, an underlying issue, I will, I will, you know, contact you guys or come back to ER. And he was really upset. And I said, no, I'm really sorry. I am going home. I'm not getting a DNC done tonight. This is not my choice. This is something I don't want to do. And you know, so I went home and then I consulted with my husband and we decided that, you know, it's best to wait it out. There was not, nothing really progressing. And he already had written a letter up and sent it to the OB that I was supposed to follow up with a week later that I already had miscarried. So when I showed up at the OB's office, they did a, another in-office ultrasound and he told me, you know, it really doesn't seem viable. And, you know, he was very genuinely concerned about my health and said, you know, I highly recommend that you take care of this situation. I said, you know, I'll go home, consult with my husband. He was a very nice, gentle um, OB, very nice. And, you know, and anyways, that ended up happening that the week later, I actually had an appointment scheduled prior to finding out I was expecting with this pregnancy for an Ottawa fertility clinic. And when I showed up at the clinic, they went through all the steps and said, you know, we're going to do an ultrasound first. If there's something viable in there, then great and if not then we have to do something about it now at this point and sure enough my my firstborn was jumping and happy inside at eight weeks and two days so looking back at the whole experience the biggest assumption he made that I was married to my cousin one and us assuming that that's what all Muslims do or that's where Southeast Asian people come from or that's their thing and number two about me covering and my vitamin D it's really interesting how he put that in perspective. And mind you, he was actually um, a descendant of an Arab community um, from his name and his, uh, his language I knew. So it's just really mm -hmm. unfortunate that these things happen, but this is where the, it builds up like a pressure cooker and then people are treated in different ways. So yeah, that's my mm -hmm. story. That's wow. So uh, like Homera, you, you kept on apologizing. You're like, I'm sorry, but I have to go. I'm sorry. And it's sad because I see this all the time with clients, regardless of their faith, where we feel as women, we need to be apologetic. It's like, I'm sorry, I can't do that right now, but, but why are we? And I think mm. it, it's sad that we need, we have to do that. And, 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 um, and I understand why you did it. And it's like almost for, for cooling yourself, for, for making yourself feel bad or sorry, better for what you're saying. But it's always necessary to be apologetic. And I think we need to like do a big awareness thing where these women don't be apologetic for what's your right. You know, it's, it's, yeah. we need to stand by it. And close to that, like I had a, a client actually um, past November, just this past uh, November, we were at the hospital, COVID times was all fun and games. And unfortunately, um, initially they said that, um, and she was a, a Muslim, uh, practicing Muslim lady. And um, she was there with her husband and, she chose me over her husband because she had a child at home. So somebody needed to take care of, of her other child. And plus the COVID times, if we can't have to support people. So I went in, a uh, nurse change happened and the other nurse comes and says, don't you want your husband here? And she was very gentle and sweet about it. And I'm like, but we were told no. She said, no, but you can, if you can find childcare for your child at home, then he can join us. And that's what happened. He joined. Another shift change was a very long birth. And uh, the initial nurse that met us at, at the ER in the beginning, or sorry, in the labor room in the beginning, came back and she said, I told you, you can't. And why did you? And like, but they allowed it. And she, the nurse that was during that, at that time or on duty at that time said that it's okay. And so that's the only reason we brought the, her husband in. Eventually she looked at me square in the eye and said, you have to leave right after birth. And I said, okay. Although in my contract, it states that I'm going to support the mom for four hours post-birth. And anyway, I couldn't do that. And there was an understanding. And throughout the whole birth, there was this particular nurse that me that was very adamant that the mom needs help. She kept on literally swinging the uh, Pitocin button. Not sorry, the, the IV button so that she can get um, more mm -hmm. epidural medication. Okay. Mm -hmm. And 
the mom had a C-section finally. She's trying for a VBAC. And she, in her mind, she's like, if I keep doing this to myself, I know I'm racking it up and I'm going to end up in the OR again to do a C-section. And I don't want to. And that's the reason why I was there to mm. keep her up, cheering her on and, you know, allow her to have the VBAC. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many times this nurse came in and literally swung the IV, the, the little button and said, you need this, you need this. And we keep telling her, no, she just needs to rest it out. She needs to rest it out. Hmm. All went well. We got to 10 centimeters. A little mishap happened. Baby was born vaginally with no episiotomy, nothing. And it, like the mom was ecstatic. Like Amazing. she was just beyond words. And the husband was there. It was such a beautiful moment. And we thought the worst was over. It hadn't been like an hour yet. Like I, I said that I would stay with the mom for an hour. The same nurse comes back um, and says, uh, by the way, you did not sign the form mm-hmm. for the uh, eye ointment because she declined the eye ointment and she had signed mm-hmm. the form. And I made sure that the other nurse got the paper because the mom was sleeping. So I didn't want to disturb her. I told her, please sign it and I'll send it off. And so that's what happened. The same nurse that was driving us crazy came mm-hmm. back you know, I have to call child services. Oh my God. And we looked at her and we were like, for what? You did not sign the form and you are declining care for your child. And this needs involvement from the child service. They need to be here. And we both looked at her and I'm like, can you please just go check the front desk? We didn't give it to you. We gave it to the owners. Can you check? Then eventually the pediatric department came in and said, oh yeah, we found the form. I'm like, well, where do you get off where like and 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 I'm glad the mom had it in her and she kind of just ate her up <laughs> she was like where do you get off speaking to anyone that way and and at that point okay the mom was African as well so there were so many different layers there that I didn't understand and I and I stood there astonished I'm like why are you assuming things can you just check and mm-hmm. even that you need to call child services does it have to be like said in that matter the mom just pushed the baby out at any point if there was wow. a situation any yani, I was just I was just taken aback by that birth and and I told and encouraged the the parent like you need to report this and mm-hmm. um, and I just wish that I as a doula can report things like this because it's just it's just uncalled for on so many different mm-hmm. yeah there's a lot of layers to that story right like the coercion the like different weirdness of you know the husband's presence and whether or not that was allowed like the various assumptions you know I'm noticing that in a lot of your stories some of what you've experienced might be described as microaggressions but some of it is pretty overt prejudice and and racism and stigma like some some of what you've described is quite open um like openly hateful and and some of it just coming from you know, as you've all talked about, this is a choice for you. And it's not a choice that like, we can't just assume all Muslim people are the same and that it's a choice that all Muslim people would make or that it's a choice that all Muslim people support. So in these healthcare actions, interactions, in your view, like what could healthcare providers be doing to improve this? Because a lot of what you've described is completely unacceptable. I'm sure anybody listening to this would agree. What would a more culturally aware approach to interacting um, with veiled patients look like? Um, I just wanted to touch back on question two. Mm -hmm. I actually have a very good experience that I wanted to um, throw in Mm -hmm. there. I know we're talking about our challenges, but also to know that there are very amazing healthcare workers and providers out there that cater to the Muslim community. And I'll tell you a, a quick story. I'll try to keep it short. But during COVID, I had a baby in 2022. Um, I've had four out of five home births. So it's a normal thing for me to just, you know, have a baby at home, especially the last four have been home births. My midwives have known me. They know me very well since my first. And this this midwife that I particularly had for this birth has been my midwife since my second. So she's known me for a couple of years and really caters to me, my family, our faith. and and overall in all aspects of it and when I had my fifth at home um, he had um, shoulder dystocia dystocia, so he was kind of stuck 
my, my midwife was amazing. Uh, both of them were amazing, but particularly talking about the one that knows me for a couple of years now, maybe seven or eight years. Very, very amazing. When he was stuck and uh, he was born, he had something called secondary sleep apnea. So he was actually born kind of um, crying, but then he kind of got stunned. So he was no longer um, um, alert and he needed CPAP. So, you know, uh, I, they're very quick, very amazing. Uh, my husband was in and out because we had the kids at home. It was COVID. A lot of things were going on. So, you know, my husband was just coming in and out with my toddler. And when he came, you know, he, he saw the newborn kind of getting CPAP. And the midwife said, you know, can you call 911 now? Because he wasn't responding from the CPAP after three minutes. And, um, you know, as soon as in three minutes when the paramedics showed up, my midwife uh, looked outside from my living room window and saw that there was a man coming right out from the paramedic truck or the ambulance. Literally said to me, you want me to go get your veil? Like, do you, you, can, can, you can tell me where it is. And all I could think of in the back of my mind in that moment in time was, even in a time of emergency, my newborn baby here is not even breathing. Like he actually had just taken his first breath as soon as the car showed up. So it mm -hmm. all worked out great. But in that moment, be, can you imagine being a midwife? You know, you have a baby here, it's COVID. And, you know, you had to ask the father to call 911. Like it was, it was a chaotic scene and she's worried about my veil. To me, that was like the most touching and the most amazing feeling you have no idea how much you love and respect I had grown for mm. this for my midwife because in a moment like that I mean even I wasn't thinking about it like or even my husband for that matter of fact he was there and he wasn't like oh you know let me let me go get something for you to cover up like it's a state of emergency it's not like mm. you know so just to just to also know that there are some amazing people out mm -hmm. there that really do care for you and I have a similar story when I had my second born actually he got influenza but we didn't know what it was so you know we he had a fever at four or five weeks and it was a very scary situation for us and we went to a local hospital and we don't have a, a we're only a level two hospital so they send us over to Ottawa you know we decided as a family to go to Ottawa when I got to Chio at the children's hospital in Ottawa they gave me a, a room with uh, like all glass um, doors. And, but they catered to me for being veiled and breastfeeding my ba newborn baby mm. in such an amazing way that I can't even tell you, like they made sure they knocked and they made sure they, mm. they had the chair facing a way that nobody could see if I was nursing my baby or not. You know, they were so, 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 um, it's it just, they were so catering. So I know we're here to speak of all the, maybe the challenges that we face in Canada as Muslim women or families, but to also know that there are so many great, great, amazing mm -hmm. people, even if they don't have the education or understanding of Islam, they're still catered to you and mm -hmm. can understand where you come from as a background. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to touch upon that. And mm -hmm. I truly have so much respect for my midwife for thinking of that in that such an intense mm -hmm. moment. I know even if you're a seasoned midwife, no matter what, a not breathing baby, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to deal with. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, so just to play off the emotions, the whole environment and what was happening in the moment for her to, to think of my, um, my faith and my, mm -hmm. my veil is so touching to me. Like I, Honestly, I cannot, I can't get over it. I get goosebumps when I think about her. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and I'm so happy that I'm a doula now because I'm, I'm excited to work with her. Like she's a local mm -hmm. midwife. So, mm -hmm. you know, to me, that's such a touching story. And I hope that whoever's listening or watching on here or will be watching that you do understand that there are just such amazing healthcare workers out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I want to hear what everyone has to say on that, but I, I just uh, want to say, I think that's a great answer to actually the third question that I asked of, as to what would good care look like? Because that's such a, a powerful moving story that in the midst of literally life and death situation mm -hmm. without compromising 
your son's safety or your safety, she still prioritized your faith and your values um, and like showed that care to you on, on all of those different levels. Um, so Kira and Helene, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think um, for in Toronto specifically, it's, it's kind of hard to accommodate uh, women like at the time of delivery, for example, if there's only a male doctor on call, because we, mm -hmm. most hospitals in Toronto are teaching hospitals. So um, they do have a lot of, you know, student nurses, students, residents, all coming into the room while a woman is um, delivering. Um, but I think that one way that they can help women, uh, veiled uh, women who wear hijab, is um, if uh, at the time of delivery or at the time like they have to do a cervical check or, you know, or something, um, if there are male residents or students who really don't need to be there at that point, um, they can, you know, ask them to just step out of the room during those times. I think just just by doing that would also really help knowing that like the main, like the doctor that's delivering, obviously if it's a male has to be there, that's totally fine. But just like the extra people who don't really need to be there, if they're male, mm -hmm. then, you know, maybe just ask them to step outside during that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Great. interesting you said that. Uh, because uh, I had a situation with a client where uh, the nurse was a male nurse um, and I think he was a student nurse. Um, so he noticed that the mom wore a veil, I wore a veil. And I think he had, I, I don't believe he was Muslim, but he seemed of Arab background. I'm not sure exactly, but he was very hesitant. Like he was standing right by the curtain the whole time. He's like in and out and he's just waiting when the, the OB called him in, he'd step in a little bit and he'd find a reason to leave. But I just felt like a sense of awkwardness for him. And at, at, and luckily, the mom delivered prior to him being called back in because uh, things progressed really quickly. But when he was called back in, uh, the, the OB asked that he hold her leg. And I kind of stepped in and I held her leg for her. And so he felt like, what do I do? And I didn't mean to come across like, I'm going to do your job. But I think he understood. He, he she felt awkward. Mm. and he himself felt awkward so I felt like it's okay to ask too it's like I didn't want to be the one to say hey by the way you make you feel really awkward can you like step outside it mm. could have been just common sense where both the OB and the nurse himself if he saw that awkwardness or, or she's trying to kind of mm. shy away and not do what she's told because he was there just to say if it's you know inappropriate or not inappropriate but if you don't feel comfortable I can come back once this is done or when you're covered or whatever. Um, and I think it's just a matter of reading people. If somebody's mm -hmm. looking upset or sad or uncomfortable, you continue doing what you're doing, regardless of a veil. You shouldn't, mm -hmm. you should stop. And so I think it's just being human and, and reading those natural um, signs, I think. Yeah, for sure. sure. I, I actually have to, um, I just want to touch upon how I feel like a lot of a lot of people perceive or have a perception that in Islam, modesty really only applies to women. And unfortunately, this is such a such a offset thinking because in Islam, modesty actually applies to both men and women. So I have um, a quick story and my husband was uh, wanting to really share this out there because it, I think it's important for people to healthcare providers to understand that, um, you know, it's not just the woman, the modesty extends and implies to more than the woman. And for example, when I had uh, a, a baby, um, I had a backup midwife. Um, generally, sometimes your midwife cannot make it. And then you have a backup. And sometimes if that one's off, then you have another backup. So I actually had a, a backup midwife that we weren't really uh, aware of or had any relationship or communication throughout my pregnancy, but she had to show up as a backup midwife. And, you know, she was great. It was it was a great experience. It wasn't like anything like bad or anything, but I remember after I had the baby and they did the vital checks and we did our skin to skin as a mother and a baby, you know, um, when I needed to um, no longer hold the baby for a while, I remember her asking my husband, would you like to do skin to skin? And my husband declined because um, for him to take off his shirt in front of her is not a modest act. And it's not something he would do, or it's not even recommended, you know. So it it was a very awkward situation. I know he mm -hmm. um, definitely felt some sort of um, judgment of like, mm -hmm. how dare you not do skin to skin? This is your baby, and mm -hmm. I don't think she understood the modesty part of mm -hmm. him. 
And uh, so I think it's really important for, for, for healthcare providers or doulas or whoever is going to be dealing with these type of families and situations that it doesn't come off that easily. Of course, he's a great father and he will do skin to skin, but just not in front of you. And mm -hmm. I feel like this perception of like, if a father doesn't want to be involved in a certain situation, it comes off as like, mm -hmm. oh, look at him. He's not involved. And unfortunately, I don't think this is mainly just towards Islam. Mm -hmm. I, have, I currently have a client who her husband doesn't really enjoy the labor part or the newborn part. And she's taken me on as her support person for that. And that's fine. But mm -hmm. he's great mm -hmm. as a father. You know, he mm -hmm. takes care of the older children. So I don't know why this perception is like, oh, if your husband's not involved in the newborn stage or like in the skin to skin or like this, mm -hmm. then it becomes like a notion of, oh, you know, a judgment type of uh, situation. So for my husband, this definitely was a, a, a big uh, issue. Like he, he definitely felt judged in the situation. Yeah. Um, so I just think it's important for people to understand that modesty applies. It's a two way road. It's not just meant for women, but it's also mm -hmm. meant for, yeah. I think yeah, that. Uh, I was just going to say that interaction is so unfortunate because there's a, a, such a different way that could be handled with more dialogue beforehand as to what's considered appropriate without making assumptions and then just rushing to judgment. Like if there had been more of a discussion as to, well, why don't you want to do this right now? Perhaps it could have been like, oh, this is why. I'll just give you a minute. Like I'll step out so that you can have this moment, right? Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's just amazing what a different interaction you can have when you're not quick to make assumptions mm -hmm. and judge. I'm sorry, Helene, you were gonna- No, no worries. Something. I was just gonna basically touch base on what you just said. You know, there's a lot of work to be done prenatally where um, just like you would ask your patient, you know, what, what are you, well, not like doctors really ask you, what are your birth wishes? But um, I think it, it's necessary that you know what they're comfortable with prior to the birth. And um, I think I wish that um, birth wishes and desires could be taken on a more serious level in general. Mm -hmm. But if a woman veils, there's a lot that comes with that. Uh, but on the, on the flip side is that if a woman veils, does it mean that in an emergency situation, you need to worry about whether her hair is covered? That's not it. Mm -hmm. Things do change, but at, at best, can try to make every patient uh, feel cared for, sensitive to those things, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this has been so informative. I am really, really grateful um, that you could all be here with us today to discuss this topic. I have learned so much and I think that, um, yeah, there was just so much practical um, learning there in the stories that you told about like what a good interaction looks like just what to think through um, and just continuously checking in with ourselves about like not making assumptions, not being judgmental, having open dialogues with people, having open dialogues with people before the actual labor and delivery is talking, is, is upon them. And, you know, I know that you said that physicians don't talk about birth wishes, but I would challenge all providers in this healthcare space to really see it as a priority to look at the whole person in this regard and, you know, how their faith and their culture and their values um, are, are really a part of the experience. So I thank you very, very much for um, being here today and sharing the stories that you shared. I know that a lot of them were really intense and personal. Um, so thank you very much for your openness. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Are there any questions? I see lots of comments in the chat. I don't see any questions though. Um, yeah, I see lots of people learning a lot from what you've shared today. So thank you very, very much. So, so much for your time. Um, okay, so um, this video will be uploaded into the videos tab of our page if you want to watch it again or share it or if you weren't able to make the live and want to watch it. 
Um, I think it's just so important that this information is out there. So thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day.